As you all enter the Zoom room, I'd like to welcome you. I think I'll get started here. And like Jamie Ann said, um, please let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat box, because we've got a global audience today, which is exciting. Okay, I'll get us started. So thank you all so much for being here today. JRA Craft is delighted to host this panel discussion, Coffee and Conversation, on the very interesting topic, Sloppy Craft. Coffee and Conversation is an educational program series dedicated to the most interesting topics in contemporary craft. We at JRA Craft are committed to advancing scholarship, education, and public appreciation of craft, as well as promoting individual achievements of excellence and in innovation in the craft field. My name is Leela Stone, and I am the Programming and Operations Coordinator here at JRA Craft, and I'm also adjunct faculty in the Art History Department at Maryland Institute College of Art. So I ask that you respectfully keep yourself on mute until the question and answer session, which will start at about 1.45 p.m. But if you do have questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat box. Um, Fortunately, we have a, a large and robust audience today, so we will probably won't be able to get to all of the questions, but please do type them up in the chat box. Um, so I'll ask you now to relax and grab a cup of coffee if you feel so inclined on this wintry day. Um, like Jamie Ann said, we have someone chiming in from Hawaii, so I know not everyone is experiencing winter, but nonetheless, grab a cup of coffee or tea and enjoy the presentation. So today we are thrilled to have featured artist LJ Roberts on the panel. LJ Roberts is a visual artist and writer who creates large scale textile installations, embroideries, artist books, and collages. Their work investigates overlaps of queer and trans politics, activism, protest, and craft. Please take it away, LJ. Um, so my name is LJ Roberts. Um, I split my time between Brooklyn, New York and the Mojave Desert. Uh, a lot of my work has to do with um, my kind of um, queer and trans community. And I also do a lot of work on kind of movement and migration, um, nomadism, travel, um, I'm from Detroit, so I'm very obsessed with vehicles and um, vessels. And um, so this, what you're looking at is a really large quilt. It's about 14 feet tall and 20 feet long. It's absolutely massive. Um, it took six years to make. I began it in 2014, finished it in um, 2020. Um, and what you're seeing is a, a conversion van. Um, it's based on a zine that a friend of mine wrote called Vanifesto that has a lot to do with this kind of culture of queer and trans people traveling in vans. Um, the history that she starts with starts with the Van Dykes who were a separatist group of lesbians in the seventies who drove around in vans and um, had kind of these wild adventures in them. There's a great story in the New Yorker um, by Aria Levy about that group. And then it goes into kind of contemporary queer and trans uh, van culture of, of people who are kind of living on the road. Um, and then this van kind of goes into a speculative fiction mode of thinking through environmental crisis and new languages and the possibilities of these kind of time and space compressing vehicles of the past, present, and future. Um, I don't know if you want to go to the next slide. We can show some details. So um, the van, you can see all the different kinds of fabrics. I use toy knitting machines a lot in my work. Um, the tail lights are actually light brights um, that have been hacked and repurposed. There's a lot of, I do a lot of playing with language. I was actually an English major studying poetry and critical literary theory and um, college and writing has always been a part of my practice. So I, I almost consider myself like a material oriented writer. But over the gas tank, you can see the word van tankerous and mandate becomes van date, van anniversary. There's all these kind of play on words. And as my friend Ariel Goldberg pointed out, 
the words are all on tools. So words as tools and um, a reclamation of language. Um, we could probably move on to the next slide. Um, so another big project of mine has been a portrait project um, that I'm kind of just wrapping up right now, but it's the, this particular project spanned 10 years from 2021 to, um, or 2011 to 2021, I had an exhibition called Carry You With Me, um, 10 years of portraits, and it's 26 portraits of friends of mine. They're all about approximately about six by four inches, like a photograph. They're all embroidered by hand. Um, I always get asked how long they take. So it's like anywhere from kind of like three months to a year, depending on the different projects I have going on. So this is my friend, Nick Naz, who I collaborate with often, most recently on a project for the um, Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum for 52 artists. They're um, an Iranian feminist filmmaker, though they now have a pretty cushy job at Netflix. So they're hard to get a hold of to make. Um, there are these great experimental films with them, but a very treasured collaborator. And if you wanna show the next slide. Um, so I also show the back of the embroideries. They're suspended between glass framed and hinged on the wall. So you can actually turn the embroidery. So you see the recto, which is the figurative side, and then the verso, which becomes more abstract. And what I'm interested with this, um, what makes me very interested in, in this kind of um, motion is that it really breaks down this binary of abstraction and figuration, particularly with portraiture. Um, they're one in the same object. And so the abstraction and the figuration is interdependent on one another. Um, so there's this way of making a portrait that embodies a lot of different kinds of qualities that typically aren't considered entirely one thing, but this is. Um, then you can go to the next slide. And then I also wanted to show, um, I, I work primarily in, I guess people think of working of me primarily working in textiles, but I also do a lot of other kind of work. Um, this was a work that was commissioned by the Brooklyn Museum that actually just entered the collection of the National Portrait Gallery, at the Smithsonian. Um, it's called Stormy at Stonewall. And um, it's a collaged, archive basically. I went into the archives of the New York Public Library and the New York Times and took a lot of their narratives that were very, um, I guess, calcified or outdated or bigoted to be perfectly honest and reconfigured them to highlight um, this real hero of the queer and trans community, Stormy de la Vrier. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time. So I would be really pleased if you researched her but um, I also consider this very related to my textile practice, even though they're big giant light boxes with collages. Um, I think there's one more detail. But, you know, if you think back to kind of the first fan image, this is basically like another practice of like collage or what people call my work as quilting. Um, so again, there's like a lot of play with language. Um, there's like a quality of zineness to it, a lot of things are being patched and sewn together, um, but it just comes out in a different way. So there's a small introduction to my work. Thanks. Thank you so much, LJ. So now please direct your attention to gallerist Mindy Solomon, whose eponymous gallery is located in the beating heart of the Arts District in Miami, Florida. Mindy Solomon Gallery specializes in contemporary emerging and mid-career artists and art advisory services. The gallery program explores the intersection of art and design through an ongoing dialogue between two and three dimensional objects while embracing diasporic voices. I urge you all to visit her website and gallery in Miami and the link will be in the chat box as well. So without further ado, please go ahead, Mindy. Thank you very much and hello to everybody. I see some names that I know in the chat box and uh, so it's great to reconnect with everybody. Um, so I guess we can maybe start, shall we start with an image? And then we can, okay, great. So um, as, as you uh, just said, the, the gallery 
is very focused on the intersection between two and three dimensional works. And when I opened the gallery 13 years ago, um, so I just had my gallery bar mitzvah. I didn't, I didn't have the party, we didn't dance the whole ring yet. But um, anyway, so, so when I opened the gallery, it sort of came from this place where I wanted to present, for example, ceramic in a way that was not perceived as craft. And so many times I would have to search through dusty shelves and crowded back rooms to find artworks. And I felt like we needed to elevate the work and to put it in a, play where, a place where it was presented and experienced at a, a kind of higher level. So that was sort of part of the premise of my initially uh, opening the gallery. But I also wanted to create this conversation between two and three dimensional works because, you know, that's how I live. And I feel like spaces exist in that way that we need to walk around things and we need to engage things. Um, additionally, you know, the, the idea of diaspora has always been important to me because I feel like we're all navigating the universe, trying to figure out how we fit in. I mean, I know that as my life has changed and I've grown in different ways, that I have to kind of realign myself in every space and every experience. And I, you know, I'm born here. I, you know, so imagining someone else coming from another culture with a different language and how they figure it out has always been really intriguing to me. So for example, the image that we're looking at is a solo exhibition uh, by Natalia Arbelez that was done in uh, 2021. And Natalia is originally from, uh, she's from Miami, but her family is Colombian. So as she describes it, her work is a combination of pre-Columbian and Saturday morning cartoons. And I think that's a great metaphor for how people try to find a way to be in a new, in a new space and to be able to effectively convey their story to the public. So if you want to uh, move on to the next image. So this is um, an installation. So the gallery has three exhibition spaces and each room kind of gives a different energy and feeling to the work when it's presented. Um, this work is by Jose Serra, who is originally from Venezuela and now making work in Santa Fe. So again, the idea of someone coming from somewhere else and melding their own cultural experience into a new language. We also participate in design fairs and um, that's been something that's been really joyous to me. I love creating spaces. I love having the opportunity to introduce furniture as well. Um, and if we want to go to the third slide. So this was a solo exhibition that we did last March by Basil Kincaid, who's an artist that I've been working with uh, since 2017. And Basil uh, had gone to, he, he received the U.S. Art Award and went to Ghana uh, I think in 2019 or 2020. And so this work was produced in his studio in Ghana. He still goes back and forth. And to me, this is also incredibly emblematic, again, of this sort of diasporic idea that we have in the program, which is an artist going to, you know, Africa, trying to, you know, create a studio, build a community there, and then we bring it back and we showcase it um, in the United States. And so this work is a combination of embroidery and quilting. I mean, we show 
Um, I mean, we show painting as well. And as I said, we, we also show uh, some furniture works and, you know, just kind of a wide array, but whatever medium we feel effectively tells the story uh, that we're trying to tell. Thank you, Mindy. Um, and we have Susan Surrett up next on the panel. Susan Surrett is a craft historian, ceramic artist, and professor at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. In 2015, she co-edited the book, Sloppy Craft, Post-Disciplinarity and the Crafts. We are excited to have Susan on the panel today and are looking forward to hearing some of her keen insight into the research side of sloppy craft. Thank you very much, Leela, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, I, uh, I have, as uh, Leela mentioned, I teach at Concordia University craft, uh, textile and ceramic histories. And um, it, I'm a ceramic artist. I, uh, do not work in sloppy craft. I started out as a textile artist. I grew up and came to age within the time of um, fine craft and the professionalization of studio craft. And perhaps we could have um, the first slide. And I think this is um, this professionalization of studio craft, to put it in context of sloppy craft, is important to consider because. Um, I don't think the term sloppy craft would exist without this deep understanding in the cultural community of what we expect out of studio craft, because sloppy craft as an oxymoron um, really puts into question all our deep understandings of skill that was developed during the studio craft movement. Um, these are some of, um, I, I worked, um, I work, still work in ceramics um, as a vessel maker and as a muralist. Um, these are some of my landscapes and perhaps we can go to the next slide. Um, this is just to point out to you um, how I do not work in sloppy craft despite those floating bits of um, ceramics that you see at the side. <laughs> Uh, those were uh, deliberately put there. So, um, and I think that this uh, probably speaks to what we consider skill and skillful, um, skillful choices that we make, conceptual choices that we make. Um, I did my PhD when I was um, quite a bit older. I got a Bachelor of Science um, from my early career as a young person. Um, then I did a B, uh, BFA at Concordia, an MA, and finally a PhD that I finished um, uh, just in 2014. So my doctorate is recent and uh, I've brought a lot of understanding, I think, from working in the craft worlds. Um, as a craft person, I was part of uh, gallery systems and I was part of uh, jury, national jury craft shows. And um, I bumped up a lot against the idea of skill in many um, aspects. And I think this really informed um, how uh, I approached the idea of the book Sloppy Craft with Elaine um, uh, Cheesley Patterson, who was my co-editor. Uh, perhaps we could go to the next slide. Thank you. I have to say that the whole idea of sloppy craft and the complexities of it uh, led into my con the, the next project that Elaine and I did together, which was craft and heritage, um, as we looked at how skill was um, really, really valued within heritage practices and craft skills. But sloppy craft um, to me has, it's, it's been brought up, well, Josh fought, um, the works of Josh fought that I don't have pictures of here really, um, really started this conversation because Ann Wilson, who was a supervisor at the time, um, was the one that coined the term and Glenn Adamson went on to write about the term and this whole idea of what seems to be sloppily put together 
um, without the idea of the fine craft um, professionalism that uh, the studio craft movement had really valued um, was brought to the fore in the works of Josh Thoughts uh, as uh, textile works. And these textile works were, uh, this, this technique was important and I don't wanna deal with this in great detail, but this technique was important because um, it was able to highlight certain issues, gender issues, uh, social hierarchies, stereotypes um, by, by breaking apart this um, assumption of skill and craft and seeing craft um, as not being finely, skillfully made as people might accept it or expect it to be. Um, this allowed an opening up of a, a possibility of looking well, if somebody is expected to make something really finely made and carefully made and they don't, why are they not doing it? And that's the question. And therefore you have to look deeply into the piece to understand why this is looking the way it is. And that's some of the power of these pieces, but it doesn't mean that they're not put together conceptually and physically very carefully and with great deliberation. And I think um, perhaps we can look at the next slide because I think uh, there's always been this juxtaposition between you know, this fine professional craft that came was part of the studio craft movement that was very much embedded in the commercial world with these uh, simultaneously, these other kinds of works such as Four Piece Five by Harmony Hammond. She did a whole series of them I'm sure you're aware of. Ed Rosbach's um, Christmas Basket, which is a collage, an assemblage of all sorts of different materials. Um, there's Faith Wilding's uh, Crocheted Environment or Womb Room that I'm sure you're familiar with all of these works that, um, that certainly speak to the notion of sloppy craft, of an assemblage, of, of putting things together without being um, particularly concerned with all the skill aspects of putting that would be expected by masters of those, um, a crochet master or a basket maker master or somebody who's been rug cooking or sorry, rug braiding for, um, for years and really mastered that technique. Um, so I think there's always been this juxtaposition between what we would, what masters of the particular medium and skills have with the actual, um, this protest against that, this, this, these reasons to explore um, what happens when we go beyond that with those materials and processes. Um, and I think there's also a limit to sloppy craft and I'm, showing you here the work by Nadia Meyer called Indian Act. Nadia Meyer um, teaches at Concordia. She's also a very well-known Canadian Indigenous artist. Um, what she did was that she took the Canadian Indian Act, which is the uh, act that um, determined uh, Indian status in the, 19th, the late 19th century, taking away many rights and dictating uh, a colonialist attitude. And she had um, over 200 people embroider over the Indian, Act, or sorry, bead over the Indian Act um, to highlight this, this aspects of this act and um, the colonial aspect of it. And the reason she chose beading is because beading has been a very important cultural expression within um, uh, within Indigenous communities. It's um, historically been women have got together around um, in groups and beaded together. Beading was a way of economic survival for centuries, well documented. And so beading is very much um, embedded within the um, Indigenous community and particularly women's beading. And it's, a way, it was, it's been a way of generations to uh, connect together. It's been, um, and it's been used as a way to reconnect generations in the wake of colonial tra uh, trauma. And so Meyer's choice of beading um, is very significant. <clears throat> How she, her beading, the activity of beading 
was that she brought together 200, uh, I think 250 people she mentioned, and she, they beat it together in groups. And they used this group beating, first of all, to learn the technique. So not all of the beating is exactly the same, which would make it perhaps look sloppy, um, but not necessarily, it's just hands working. So the, these people were getting together and learning the beating skills, but they were also getting together and talking about the implications of uh, the Indian Act on their lives. And I think this is an interesting um, uh, intersection of where what could be called sloppy craft comes together with community building. And if these, this beating was done um, with threads hanging out, with beads not in a line, um, there would be something lost because beading is a skill that is powerful. It gives power to the people. It gives power to the Indigenous makers that use it. Economic, social, um, young Indigenous makers are using it in terms of political power. So in this sense, um, skill the idea of sloppiness wouldn't really um, wouldn't really go very far because it's the idea of fine skill or or learning fine skill that is becomes important and in this case skill is power in sloppy craft sloppy is power so I think this is an interesting stretch of of, of where skill can be it can be powerful. Um, if it's skillfully done, and it can also be uh, equally um, powerful socially with, uh, to make uh, in intervene in uh, important issues if um, what appears is sloppy too. So I think that a sloppy craft, I think the idea of sloppiness is a wonderful concept to really explore in so many ways. And it's not a love term. Uh, Nadia Meyer told me she never thought of her work as sloppy and um, despite the irregularities in it and personally I don't either and I look at LJ's work and I know and Josh Watts even and I, I, I'm familiar with them both and I know that their work is highly um, technically well done um, and perhaps sloppy um, allows us to highlight concept more so those are some of my initial thoughts of sloppy craft. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. That's fascinating. And I like how you included the sort of limitations or you know, perceived limitations. Um, I think that would bring us now to the discussion section of today's presentation. And so just a little bit of background, Susan already uh, touched on it a bit. But so in 2007, while at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Professor Ann Wilson, who was our Distinguished Educator Awardee last year in 2022, described her student and artist Josh Fott's work as sloppy craft. At the time, the idea purported that concept takes precedence over skill. The tension lies in the quandary that Wilson noted. Fott's work was in fact highly skilled. And I think that brings us to today. And I think without further ado, I would like to ask Susan, um, and we have we already have the question in the chat box too. Could you please define sloppy craft? Uh, you know what? I don't think I can define sloppy craft. I, I think that there are, I think from what I've understood when I look at it is that the observer defines it. Um, I don't know if the artist would define their work as sloppy craft. In fact, I think many artists won't because for one thing, sloppy is not really something that's um, uh, I th is highly valued. So, and I think craft even is a problematic term because you get into sloppy craft and you've got, um, you move into the importance of, um, the highlight of concept rather than material skills. And this idea moves into perhaps what fine arts are doing, contemporary arts are doing, where concept trumps um, many skills. And I think this might speak to as well, um, the idea of 
uh, fine uh, uh, contemporary artists using craftspeople to create those parts of their work that require a lot of skill. Um, Aram Cifuentes calls this colonizing craft. So I, um, I, I really, I, I wouldn't, I can't define it. I think it's um, an indefinable term that is more interesting to explore rather than to define. That makes sense. Um, and that's fascinating. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I'd like to turn our attention to LJ D and sort of how could it, or has it played out in your work as of yet? Um, well, I think that my association with the word is, is somewhat problematic. Um, <laughs> I see Elaine's question, which is how does the artist feel about it? And I just wanna thank Elaine because um, she's been a really great supporter of mine for years. And I know she wants me to speak my mind as always, but um, I think it has not, I think that there's a lot to unpack with how, with like this whole Josh fought Ann Wilson, Glenn Adamson thing, which is to say that like, there's all, all of these people who are not men here <laughs> talking and we're, we've like managed to center a white man's work. And also like that word sloppy craft was given by dominant culture, like Ann Wilson and Glenn Adamson to artists who are working with like very marginalized identities and very marginalized cultures. So to me, like this kind of like hegemonic dominance of that term is to put that on my work is, you know, talk about like colonizing, <laughs> you know, and, and there's a, there's a lot of nuance that has to be recognized within sloppy craft, you know, calling Josh sloppy is really different than calling me sloppy. Like I'm a person with a very illegible gender. Um, you know, the way that I dress is not, you know, I dress very masculine. Sometimes people will like call that, that kind of stigma that follows people who are either lesbians or trans or non-binary is really harmful. Um, so for me to like get lumped into that has been an uncomfortable position for me. Um, my work is made, I is, I'm completely precise about my work. I practice installing my work in my gallery, like I'm drilling, you know, like I'm, like I used to be an athlete. So I'm like, it's basically like practice and practice and practice. Um, you know, I think that, I think that what really needs to be done with this like term sloppy craft is it has to be picked apart and there needs to be like all different sorts of words that fall under that that are much more nuanced. And then the other thing that needs to happen is that term needs to be looked at in terms of who it can be applied to in a way that's beneficial. And, um, you know, I think that you see a demographic that's like, not included or doesn't want to be included because that stigma still holds true. And, you know, as an artist, my work is a lot about, you know, this like struggle of queer and trans rights and dignity. And I, I understand that there, you know, I wrote my whole thesis on this way of, you know, overemphasizing amateur techniques and craft. I use toy knitting machines on my work a lot. I push against mastery, but that's also to challenge like dominant cultures, um, you know, kind of that the prowess that it wants to have over that. And I don't think that's sloppy. I actually think it's like a completely, you know, tight retort to what dominant culture, to dominant culture's own sloppiness. I hope that made Elaine proud. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, again, thank you for being here and sharing your, you know, a part of your important history with us. Um, and kind of in this, along in uh, the same vein, I would like to ask Mindy 
um, how, if it does, if sloppy craft, does it play a role in your gallery or in the space that you sort of operate and program? I mean, I, I can tell you, honestly, I've never sold a work of art using the term sloppy. Um, I, you know, I just, I think as time has gone on and I've seen so much work being made, that I have gotten a, an aesthetic appreciation for things that are intentionally off kilter, which can be a metaphor for life. I mean, my frizzy hair is intentionally unkempt, you know? I mean, whether someone wants to call it sloppy or not is their own definition, but to, to quantify and, quanti uh, and qualify work in that way uh, just feels like a diminishment. And, and I don't really like it. Um, but interestingly enough, I was talking to my friend who is uh, a textile artist on the way to the gallery. And I said, I'm participating in a sloppy craft panel. And she said, yeah, that's my work. And I said, what? I mean, she has... She's a minimalist textile artist where instead of having the traditional idea of the textile hanging on the wall as a two-dimensional rectangle, she has it draped and, and very specifically folded and, ple and pleated on frames. And there is nothing sloppy about her preparations in her work though they kind of look like they're arbitrarily tossed onto something. She spends hours arranging those pleats. So I think that I would like to replace the word sloppy with intentional because these decisions are very specific. And they come from a very intuitive place within the artist. I mean, you can see this painting next to me by Thrush Holmes that feels, you know, very gestural and loose. But that comes from a lot of thought and a lot of intentionality in the making. I also think from, you know, having a business that kind of sits you know, I'm a contemporary art gallery that has really continued to push uh, against definition, against specification. I mean, there was a period in the art world where every dealer was saying to me, oh, you can only have six people on your website. And I'm like, that's so boring. I mean, you know, I like to look around. I'm a shopper, you know. So I think that this idea that we have to constantly be pushing back has finally allowed a space in the, in the art world where people are looking at, are considering all facets. Now, the, the maker is going to be more obsessive about the finish of a work. The maker is gonna look at that first, but other people will regard the idea first and the making second. And there's so much inventiveness that's being embraced right now. This is a very interesting year. 2023 is a very interesting year for art. There's a whole lot of things that are coming forward. We don't necessarily, in my mind, have a specific darling. That's just my opinion. But I think that a lot of things are coming forward. A lot of interesting things are being looked at and considered because we're in this state of confusion and flux. So we want comfort and we want discovery. And so a lot of things that are handmade are going to become very, very interesting to people. Does that help? Absolutely, fascinating. Um, it's always interesting to hear sort of like, you know, a keen insight into what's what could possibly happen, right? Um, and I think we've brought up so many different interesting points of tension within the topic that, again, we, we don't have enough time to cover it all. And I don't think that's what we're here for. I think we're here to sort of add to the story. And um, But we do have an interesting question that maybe one of you would like to answer. 
Um, is sloppy craft just clickbait? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I I think it's, its purpose is to open up questions. It's all it's open its purpose is to uh, open up questions about what is craft and what is slot and how craft should be and um, what is that skill area that craft is so closely associated with, as Adamson pointed out in, in his first book, you know, when he was examining uh, craft from all aspects and skill was associated with craft. And I think because of, of that 2007 year when this term came up, it grew from, you know, uh, Adamson's, Adamson's interest in 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 the aspects of craft, which included skill and his um, deep discussion of that. Um, so yeah, in a way, I think it is clickbait, but I think it's very interesting way of opening up a very important discussions about people's work. And, you know, as LJ was talking about is who is using this and why they're using it and, um, and and appreciation of why it's being used and understanding. I, I, also I, I think, oh, sorry. I, I think I can push against it being clickbait actually, because <laughs> um, interestingly enough, because I do think like, frankly, there's some like messy, messy queens out there. And, you know, I think that some of them really want to say like, I'm sloppy and this is my mess and you have to deal with this now. Um, that's not what I'm doing at all. Um, but I can like appreciate someone just being, you know, I think that that's part of what people do to survive. I think it's what people do to thrive. I completely appreciate a messy queen <laughs> at certain times. Um, I think there's another question in the chat and I'm having, there's a lot going on. So I may not be getting this entirely right, but it's like, the question is, can the, if the person self-identifies with it, does it become empowering or does that term become demeaning if someone else is giving them that term sloppy? And I think that that's a really good question. And I also, it makes me think of this term in academia because I teach at an art school and um, people like to use this term like queer failure a lot. And at first everyone was like jumping on it. And then I was having a talk with my partner about it. And, you know, she said to me like, well, who's allowed to fail? You know, you know, there there's people that are not, you cannot fail. And for me, that's not an option. Like I can't fail. I, if I fail, I don't survive. So there's like a position where you can be sloppy and you can say like, oh, I'm a really put together person. And, you know, I have my gender is not questioned, the color of my skin is not questioned. But if you have other factors that, you know, preclude you to vulnerability and sloppy might be stigmatizing or failure might not be empowering in something you do, I think that that's a question. So I want to make room for people to have that space to be like messy and sloppy and to be productive there. I just think that it's, has to be approached with so much nuance. Well, as a mother of four, sloppy was not in my narrative. I mean, I, I again, I look at, I, you know, I, I feel like sloppy. I mean, I used to do, we haven't done it recently, but we did a, a curated show for several years with BFA grads and basically had to educate them about the power of the curatorial statement and editing the show and, you know, what to hang up and all of that stuff or display. And to me, when I see something sloppy in my definition, when I see an unfinished edge or, or a chip or a break, and someone says to me with their eyes down, I meant for that to happen. My, my, you know, wonder twin power activates and my mother of four personality comes out and I say, go back and fix it. I think that, again, I go back to the term intentionality. 
intentionality to me is very different than sloppy messy. Now you're in academia. I'm in a I'm in the business of adaptation of work to ownership. So I look at things and I and I and I review them and I see that they are acceptable, not just to me. I mean I'm the I'm the gatekeeper essentially, but will they be acceptable to the public in terms of the intentionality of that gesture? If that makes sense. So I think that when around the time that the sloppy craft term started to be used, I sort of witnessed a pushback in the art world between, you know, contemporary artists that looked at craft as a secondary form of art making and thought that being slo sloppy was a reaction and a kind of way to say, well, I'm not, I'm not making craft, just look at what I'm doing, you know? And then there was some great, there was some great dialogue that happened where people were being really critical. I remember Garth Clark wrote some great stuff about it, you know, and as only he could. And, and I don't see so much of it. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not seeing the amount of stuff that was pouring out at one point. I think it's kind of sifted. It's like it just kind of went through the sieve and now the, the, the good stuff, the intentional stuff is kind of staying around and you know we're, we're kind of broadening. But you know, I'm, I, have, I have parameters about in my own mind about what I think is real and intentional, I go back to that word again, and what I think is cutting corners and making excuses. Thank you, Mindy. Um, I think for the last eight or eight to 10 minutes, we should open up the um, question and answer session. I mean, we've had some really awesome questions in the chat box, but if anyone wants to sort of raise their hand or um, unmute themselves and ask a question, we can go ahead and um, try to field any questions now. Um, Interesting. Leela, I think that there's been some shy people and I've been trying to put those questions in the chat as well. So oh, if there's you. anyone who's opposite and they do not want to speak out loud, but would like their question to be included in the chat, um, you can send it to me privately and I can post it on your behalf. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you, Jamie Ann. Um, I do see a question that we could probably flush out. Um, Okay, so there's a few of them. How about this? Is is this a broader issue with reclaiming any terminology, empowering when choosing yourself, but still demeaning when assigned? Um, or another question is, how does sloppy craft differ from abstract expressionism in the early studio craft movement? Uh, I I don't think it does. Sorry, Mindy, do you want to go ahead? No, I, I'll wait until you're done. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't really think it, it does. I think, <clears throat> you know, in the early, um, I, I know that, um, that Rossbach said, you know, I like to make things like um, a kid could make, you know, and that's one of the things that, um, one of the expressions that came up with sloppy craft is somebody, uh, Adamson, I think, quote, says, well, you know, people say, well, my kid could do that. And, you know, the same thing came up with Pollock's paintings, with his action paintings. Everybody thought, well, he's just throwing paint on canvas. Anybody can do that. And so I don't, under, you know, abstract expressionism was about, in some ways, it's, it's very aesthetically similar, I think, because it's all about stretching materials and stretching gestures and, and stretching processes and taking them apart and deconstructing them. I think sloppy craft is part of that, but I also think it um, uh, plays more with societal concepts as, as LJ points out with gender hierarchies, with stereotypes. So I think there's um, uh, sometimes 
more of a, a conceptual, a contemporary conceptual engagement than, than it was with abstract expressionism. Interesting. But, and, and I think also that, you know, when people would say that to me, I, I remember when we lived in Cleveland and I took my, we took my in-laws to the museum and my mother-in-law was looking at some abstract painting and said, my Durand glass is better than that you know, because she was, loved this studio uh, glass. And my response is always, but you didn't think of it. And somehow when people make those gestures, you know, even though it seems random and simple, there's balance, there's composition, there's, there's a use of color and it all works. And if you don't know what you're doing and you don't have the talent for it, it doesn't work. So that's like the inherent difference right there is that, that the artist, the true artist knows how to take a pile of yarn and arrange it in a way that it looks like a work of art where someone else just doesn't know how to do it. And so the genius lies in how, how it comes out, how it's expressed and uh, I was having, a we did an artist talk last night actually with an artist that is a textile artist and, and one of the people in the audience brought up the craft conversation, which is always interesting. And um, also about how viewers experience and receive artworks. And that's a huge part of the whole thing. Does it resonate with somebody? Does it resonate? And and if it resonates, um, sounds like if the tree falls, but if it resonates, does it really matter what the definition is as well? LJ, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, not not to this not to this question. I don't think. Okay. I think what was said was great. Um, okay, so I think we'll take another anonymous question. Uh, what do you think this? Okay, so why do you think this started in textiles, and does this term apply to other mediums? I think that's a good question. Well, well, someone asked if um, William Weisberger asked about the Delatory brothers, and I worked with the Delatory brothers for a number of years, so I think they're actually a good example to bring up um, because he talks about the fact that they use these, you know, historic traditional techniques to create very playful, seemingly playful images, but. But again, it goes back to intentionality where, I mean, I remember like I had people come in my gallery when I had their work on display and they're like, we collect glass, do you have any glass? And I said, well, I have these artists. And they looked at it and they're like, it's not glass. What is that? You know, it was a, it was a, a glass piece of, you know, it was like they're part of their virgin vagina series. And, you know, they just, that's not glass. Um, but it's about the message, which we talked about earlier. It's about the message. And um, I'm seeing that, you know, there's, we're doing a, a big textile, too bad I didn't reach out to you earlier, LJ. We're doing a big textile show in the gallery, huge, because there's so much stuff and I just keep adding things. And there's such a variety of ways that people are using textile now, so far beyond quilting and weaving so many different types of material being incorporated, so much space being utilized, so much additional media being added. I mean, I think it's exciting. I think it's awesome. So I hope it just continues to spill out into all forms. Yeah, I always think it's, um, I think I always, um, when I see a question of like, when did this start? I, I always think about the fact that um, you, you never know when things start because this is the only thing, this is a moment that rose to the surface, but cl there are clearly other moments everywhere all over different 
geographies and cultures. So I don't think you can name when when this started. It was just, you know, at a prestigious academic institution by two people who have a, you know, platform. Um, so, you know, I think that I agree with Mindy. I think it's it can be all over and that it's expanding a lot. Um, I think you see some interesting things with ceramics happening. Um, I like to think that with what are considered craft mediums that I actually love illegit like illegitimate, what are what's considered illegitimate or like illegible forms because I feel that way myself as a person in the world. And so I feel like textiles in terms of this like, weird struggle that it thinks it has with legitimacy, which I think is crap. Um, you know, I think they've always been legitimate. I think you look at someone like Rosie Lee Tompkins and you're like, this is the most genius thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And it's been around forever, you know, for a really long time. So, you know, my feeling is that there's like, there's just, it happened like this pollination, there's cross pollination everywhere. And just because something comes out in a book that's published doesn't mean it didn't start in all sorts of different realms. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I hope that that cross pollination continues on into all sorts of mediums and thoughts and that what's happening right now in this conversation in terms of coming at it from like a very critical lens, um, is also expands to like people who, you know, aren't just white or like, aren't just like assigned female at birth or like have like this broader conversation. Cause I think it's gonna be really important to like pull in all of those voices. And you see a lot of art that's really doing a lot of that work speaking for itself. The art speaks for itself and that's what you want also. And um, so I'm like really happy to see all of this work being produced that's doing that, that's doing that right now, no matter what it's called. Fascinating. So I think that's the perfect place to um, kind of wrap up this super interesting conversation that we've uh, managed to um, bring about. Um, and I want to thank you all again LJ, Mindy, and Susan for um, just being here today. It's been a pleasure and, and a joy. And I would like to thank you all too in attendance for your participation today. Um, if you are not a member of JRA Craft, please consider joining today. We have our website in the chat box as well. And then stay tuned for our next program in the Convert Con Coffee and Conversation series that's going to cover the topic of sustainability in the craft field, uh, which should prove to be uh, fascinating and interesting as well. Um, and just a, um, another note, so we're very excited about our Distinguished Artist Series, which kicks off February 4th and 5th with the brilliant sculptor Christina Cordova. If you would like to um, go ahead and register, we have a free lecture and then also an online presentation of her studio work. And um, so again, the, the website is in the chat box. Thank you all again so much for being here and I wish you all a pleasant afternoon. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.